Is upfront autologous stem cell transplant always preferred or can autologous stem cell transplant be done at first relapse? Stem cell transplant still has a role. And when you compare it to no transplant, you obviously have great advantages, both in terms of response, in terms of uh, duration of remission, in terms of overall survival life expectancy. But the question about upfront versus delayed transplant, and there one can come up with the argument that, well, even if I delay the transplant, and studies have been done, there are at least two large randomized trials, one early on in 1998 uh, by the French group and the second one in 2017 by the other French group, but uh, by incorporating all the newer treatment. And they both more or less showed similar results that with upfront stem cell transplant versus delayed transplant, more patients achieved complete remission so depth of response is there with upfront transplant versus delayed transplant. Number two, progression-free survival is longer with upfront transplant. Uh, but overall survival was about the same. But then, uh, especially in the more recent trial, given uh, the treat effective treatments for myeloma, um, we may want to wait a little longer before we say that overall survival is... Uh, about the same. But one can make an argument for a delayed transplant that, well, I would rather delay treatment to later. But my counter argument to that would be that if your intent is to achieve the deepest and the most durable remission, then this upfront is the time. Because we know that with modern treatments, uh, based on some of the recent trials, the first remission can last uh, on average uh, between five and a half to six years. And it could be much longer in patients who have deeper remission or who do not have high-risk chromosomal abnormalities. So you achieve a deep and durable remission. Post-transplant, sure, patients do need treatment, but in this day and age, um, that treatment is quite manageable. And clinical trials have shown that patients have taken uh, revlimid or lenalidomide for extended period of time, or even high-risk patients have taken a proteasome inhibitor, uh, whether it's bortezomib, and now, of course, uh, more data coming out with exazomib. Uh, so you can do upfront transplant, and you can stay on maintenance treatment, maintaining a fa fairly decent quality of life. And this was shown in actually the French study that was done in the 90s. Some of the other arguments in uh, favor of upfront transplant that I make to uh, my patients uh, also include that you want to get a more intense treatment when you are younger and, under, and in better health. Again, with time, no one gets younger. And with time, of course, we can develop other diseases. So later on, you may not be eligible for high-dose therapy, either because of age, because of some other uh, morbidity that someone developed. Uh, sometimes it's the disease that has become more resistant, and you get much less out of that transplant than you would get up front. So again, it's more of a philosophical argument, but as a transplanter and looking at the overall data, I try to convince patients uh, with upfront transplant, but I fully respect someone's decision when they decide to delay it uh, uh, to a later time. The upfront transplant, so I always tell patients, you know, it's the one that works the best because the myeloma uh, is, a, is a strange cancer, as you know, is a strange uh, black cancer because unfortunately, even if you go in a, in deep remission, in complete remission, it will eventually come back because the myeloma hides and, and that's the reason why the chemotherapy works because there is a better penetration. So what's happening when, uh, when the myeloma comes back, and I always tell my patients, when you relapse post-transplant, you're not gonna die of myeloma because we have so many new therapies. Over the last couple of years, uh, many new drugs approved, the selinexoris, atuxima, Bellaprep, the CAR T cell a few weeks ago. But you have to start over. And every time, if you look at the, the, the durability of responses, the first one is the longest. And then it becomes shorter and shorter until you, know, you are not going in remission anymore. So I always bet all my money on upfront. I want your, my patient to achieve the maximum response with good induction, the transplant, and then stay there. And I follow them with minimal residual disease sequentially and try to keep them there in the negativity. So that we know, 
the, the transplant, the average is five years, but we do have a lot of patients, five, 10 years here at Duke has started in 99. And I have patients that are uh, at the transplant many years ago. So when you do the transplant after, later, it doesn't last as long because now your myeloma is more resistant, is more refractory. So you can use a second transplant. If your first lasted 10 years, you can do the second and say, okay, I'm gonna make a last, a little bit last, but still a long time, right? Because the rule used to be half of the time and now we can stretch it with the, with the maintenance. But if, you, if your transplant lasts only a couple of years, the second is not gonna last much longer. And if you do a transplant after you fail many lines of therapy, it's not gonna last as long. So it's almost becoming a bridge where you can decrease the myeloma burden, help the patient to get a little bit better, and then maybe put an additional therapy and another clinical trial, another therapy. The approval for transplant is for, you know, at diagnosis as a consolidation type of therapy to get the disease in its deepest level of remission, whether that be a complete remission or minimal residual disease negative state. Do we commonly do it at first relapse or as a salvage type of treatment in the later lines? Uh, we have done it, but preferentially doing it that first time or as a first consolidation will really get you the most benefit. In the era of novel immunotherapies such as CAR-T, um, we certainly haven't had a study that looks at, or we have some now that are upcoming looking at CAR-T and transplant or CAR-T post-transplant. But, um, you know, we can't say at this point that CAR-T will take the place of a transplant. We don't have enough data for that. No, if you're leaning towards a transplant, get the transplant done sooner rather than later. Um, if you have issues and, you know, everybody has sort of life-related issues, have that discussion, have those stem cells in, uh, in the bank, and certainly waiting on the transplant and getting it right at a time which is convenient is perfectly reasonable, but make sure you have those stem cells in the bank for you. Looking at the progression-free survival, you know, one would say that most people won't want to do it. We've moved away, though, from three drugs now, and we're using quadruplets already. So in the context of quadruplets, what we've actually assumed is that transplant should be done in everybody, and we've actually incorporated transplant in all of the clinical trials. In the real-world setting, when we're seeing such deep responses with quadruplets, a lot of people are deferring that transplant, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as you follow patients closely. So monitoring patients is critical. I think keeping that option as an option to access as and when you need it and having that conversation with your oncologist is critically important. And then, uh, you know, making that decision on whether you want, you're the kind of person who wants it up front or you're willing to wait on it a little bit is really, that's the kind of discussion which needs to be had when we do not see an overall survival advantage.